Hey guys, Professor Gooden here to talk with you about hormones. In this video, we'll describe what they are and how they interact with their target tissues. As I mentioned in the intro, I'm Professor Jacob Gooden from Point Loma Nazarene University, and in this video, we will be talking about hormone and muscle tissue interactions. Now, this is going to be just an overview of this topic as presented in the book, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, put out by the NSCA. And this is not an in-depth physiology video, but more to acquaint you as a future strength coach, future coach, future trainer, athletic trainer with the world of hormones and why it's important to program with hormones in mind. So let's take a look. As I mentioned before, this comes from chapter four of the book, Essentials for Strength Training and Conditioning, this chapter by Drs. Kramer, Vingren, and Spearing. Now, a few key terms to go over first. First, hormones. Hormones are the chemical messengers of the body. They are synthesized, stored, and released into the blood by endocrine glands and other cells in our various organs. Endocrine glands are body structures specialized for releasing hormones into the blood. So essentially, hormones tell our body's tissues what to do, and most of them stick around for a while. They have a long half-life, whereas our nerves and certain catecholamines can have very quick and acute effects on tissue. Hormones tend to have moderate to longer duration effects on the target tissue. Now, we synthesize, store, and secrete hormones in several different organs, ranging from uh, structures in the brain, like the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, down to the thyroid gland, the heart, the adrenal glands, liver, pancreas, kidneys, and the ovaries and testes. So, th really throughout the body, most of our major organs are secreting, storing, and synthesizing hormones. Now, in our context, as future strength coaches, as sports scientists, or sport coaches, or just people who are working in the performance industry, our main concern is muscle. How, does, how do hormones affect muscle tissue? Well, hormones are intimately involved with protein synthesis and degradation mechanisms that are part of muscle adaptations to resistance exercise. So notice that that was both synthesis and degradation. So not only do certain hormones help you to build up more muscle tissue, but some actually break muscle tissue down. And it's important to know the mechanisms that cause each. So this includes both anabolic and catabolic hormones. Anabolic primarily being testosterone and secondarily growth hormone, and catabolic being things like cortisol. Now the presence or absence of hormones and their concentration in the blood is not the only thing that mediates their effects. There's also the mediating effect of hormone receptors. So the lock and key theory is a theory that describes hormones as a kind of a key and the receptor as a sort of lock on the cell. And if the key fits into the lock, then that key will have an effect on the cell, whether it's through a second messenger system or through some sort of entry into the cell. But if that lock changes conformation, perhaps it's down-regulated and those receptors are no longer accepting new hormone molecules, then the key will not fit in the lock. And therefore, even if you have that hormone, a specific hormone, whichever one you're looking at, in the blood, it may not interact with the target tissue if down-regulation has occurred. So this schematic here is showing various locks. So we have receptor A, receptor B, and receptor C, and they have different locking mechanisms. And these different hormones, hormone A, B, and C, those keys are made to fit the specific locks. But there are other factors that also affect these locks. For instance, an allosteric binding site, there might be a chemical that interacts with this receptor in order to enable it to accept hormone A. Or there might be a hormone with a potential cross-reactivity to receptor C, such that it could also bind to this receptor. So it's not as simple as a one-to-one -one correspondence between hormones and their receptors. There's a lot of complexity going on here. 
So the inability of a hormone to interact with the receptor, as I mentioned before, is called downregulation. Alterations to a receptor's binding characteristics or to the number of receptors can be as dramatic an adaptation as the release of increased amounts of hormone from an endocr endocrine gland. So what that's saying is that the amount of hormone in the bloodstream is important, but sometimes it's just as important to upregulate or downregulate certain hormone receptors on the target tissue. Now there are several categories of hormones that we have to discuss. The first are steroid hormones. These are fat soluble and they diffuse passively across the cell membrane. So here in this figure we have the typical steroid migration into a target cell and this is showing testosterone entering the cell but it it's actually showing both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone in sex-linked tissue. So only one of these pathways will actually occur in a cell. It depends on if it's a secondary sex-linked tissue or a non-sex-linked tissue. So here's a bigger picture of, that, of those pathways. And we see that luteinizing hormone, which is secreted by the pituitary gland, is released and it triggers a change in the testes where the Leydig cells start to produce testosterone and testosterone actually physically enters the cell with the help of 5-alpha reductase. Once it's in the cell, it binds to receptors actually on the nucleus. Okay, and if this is a sex-linked tissue, then certain things occur like spermatogenesis or sexual differentiation. If it's a non-sex-linked tissue, then things like protein synthesis in a muscle cell might occur. Another category of hormones are polypeptide hormones. These hormones are made out of chains of amino acids and they are going to actually interface with a receptor on the surface of the cell, that lock and key theory that we spoke about earlier. Now once they interface with that receptor, they essentially unlock this second messenger system, this jack stat signaling pathway. So we see this large molecule here, this JAK2 molecule, and it's going to send this STAT messaging molecule down to the nucleus to alter gene transcription in some way. So although this hormone binds to an external receptor, we need the secondary messenger, in this case STAT, um, to be activated so that it can enter the cell nucleus. And then finally, we have amine hormones these are synthesized from the amino acid tyrosine or tryptophan and includes hormones like epinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So these bind to membranes via second messengers. Now these are not regulated by negative feedback. All the other hormones we've spoken about, as the body senses the buildup of these hormones, it actually starts to shut down the body's own production of them. This is one reason why if you take exogenous hormones like testosterone, your body starts to shut down its own production of testosterone. But rather these specific hormones, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, uh, they don't function on this negative feedback loop. They can actually stay elevated for quite some time and can lead to a variety of syndromes. But these hormones actually will diffuse and then become metabolized when external stimuli cease. Now these hormones are often associated with the fight or flight response. They are very temporary in their effects. So if something jumps out and scares you, your heartbeat will go through the roof, blood will start pumping to all the working muscles, your hair will stand up on end, and you'll get ready to fight something or run away from it, right? But as soon as that external fear stimulus goes away, your heartbeat slows down, these hormones diffuse into the bloodstream and it kind of goes away, right? And then you go back to normal, back to your normal resting state. However, it can stay elevated for a while, especially if you have chronic anxiety or chronic fear or chronic stressors of some other kind, maybe like training. And then these can stay elevated for a long time because there is not that negative feedback loop. Now, hormones are secreted before, during, and after resistance exercise. Due to, the due to the physiological stress of resistance exercise. And really as few as one or two heavy resistance exercise sessions can increase the number of androgen receptors in the muscle. So with everything that we've just talked about with hormones, 
the fact that they are chemical messengers of the body, the fact that they produce long-term changes in the target tissue, that there's this lock and key mechanism where if you actually prepare those locks, those receptors, and upregulate them, either creating more of them or making them conform better to that hormone, that you can actually alter the target tissue to the same extent as if you had more hormones in the blood. All of that put together is important for understanding the effects of hormones on the muscle tissue after resistance training. So really, if you train once or twice in succession, maybe in a week, you hadn't been training before, then you pick up some weights, they're fairly heavy, you lift them a few times, you put them down, right? You get a good session in or two sessions, and that could be enough to upregulate your receptors for testosterone. I mean, that's amazing, that's great, and that will create, that will begin creating long-term changes in your muscle tissue. So the key point here is that the specific force produced in activated fibers, and it's important that these are activated fibers, right? So the fibers that are not activated during resistance training do not reap the benefits of these upregulations. The specific force produced in activated fibers stimulates receptor and membrane sensitivities to anabolic factors, including hormones, which leads to muscle growth and strength changes. Now the big question on your mind should be, well, what are the specific force requirements of the muscles? Don't worry, we'll get there. So mechanisms of hormonal interactions. The combination of many different mechanisms is thought to stimulate exercise-induced hypertrophy. Okay, it's, it's multifactorial. It's not just one thing or another. It's not just heavy weights. It's not just high volumes. It's not just high mechanical tension. It's multiple things. We know that molecular signaling, including hormones, is involved with the process, and this signaling is influenced by neural factors that provide important signals to the skeletal muscle and thus can augment the anabolic process. Now with exercise, there are changes in the content of hormones within the blood. However, peripheral concentrations of hormones, peripheral meaning you know outside of the muscle cell itself, peripheral concentrations of hormones in the blood do not indicate the status of the various receptor populations. Remember that these receptors are important um, or the effects of the hormone within the cell. So you might have more testosterone than the next guy floating around, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of that testosterone is able to bind with the muscle cells and have its effect. Typically, however, we assume that a large increase within an individual in hormone concentration will indicate a higher probability for interactions with receptors. So while an individual may have a certain level of testosterone and comparing that individual to another is maybe comparing apples to oranges because of the effects of those receptors, if that same individual now increases his or her levels of anabolic hormones in the bloodstream, then that leads to more potential interactions with the muscle tissue. Now here are some physiological mechanisms that can contribute to changes in peripheral blood concentrations of hormones with exercise. So the first is the circadian pattern. So we actually know that there are two times during the day when testosterone peaks. It's actually highest for men in the morning, and then there's another peak again sometime around the mid to late afternoon. And so there is some theory that maybe we should train in the morning to really harness that uh, little peak in testosterone in that anabolic hormone as we're uh, waking up. Also, fluid volume shifts. So if you have X amount of testosterone in the blood and suddenly you sweat a lot of that blood away uh, due to water, now your volume of blood is less, but you have the same amount of testosterone. Likewise, if you have drinking a lot of water, now that hormone is more diluted. Now there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't try to concentrate the hormone content in your blood by becoming dehydrated. It's probably much worse to be dehydrated for your anabolic signaling than it is to have that little bit of extra concentration. Also, tissue clearance rates. How quickly are you clearing that specific hormone out of the blood? Venous pooling of the blood. So is that blood sticking around for a long time? Is the muscle becoming engorged with blood? Are you training to get a pump? Is there a buildup of metabolites in the muscle from training? Is there uh, cell damage in the muscle because of training? And now all this blood is pooling there instead of returning to the heart. And it's stuck there with those hormones. Also, hormone interactions with binding proteins. So for instance, testosterone can be traveling around free or bound to a protein in the blood and then unable to interact with the target muscle tissue. 
So the last key point to talk about in this super brief intro to hormones is that hormone responses are tightly linked to the characteristics of the resistance training protocol, meaning that the way that our bodies respond hormonally to exercise is directly linked to the way that we program that exercise. Are we doing higher rep sets or lower rep sets? Are we using heavy loads or loads that are maybe too light? Are we using super long rest times or are we constraining the rest to shorter times? Are we using large muscle mass exercises or small muscle mass exercises? All of these things will have an effect on how much of each hormone is produced. Now it's really hard to measure exactly how much in individuals, but we do know enough that we can give some guidelines on how to program exercise to get the best hormonal response that we can. And in the next video, that's what we're gonna talk about. So click over to the next video to learn how to leverage our hormonal response to exercise through evidence-based programming techniques. All right guys, thanks for watching this video. If you had any questions, let me know down in the comments and I'll see you all on the next video.